So Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the gateway. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he has all these beautiful uh, images and, and, and symbols of bread of life and living water. And the gate is uh, one of the most powerful for me. And so I took a picture representing this. Jesus is the gate, but I would suggest that this is not what he had in mind. Can you see that from where you are? Because it looks like there's light shining on it. I took this in Evergreen, Colorado. There's an almost two-mile loop around a lake, and there's people that live anywhere from 50 feet to 100 yards off the, the public trail. And so these folks put up this beautiful gate, locked with a chain, keep gate closed, and there's no fence. <laughs> About 10 years ago, I had a pastor come to my office at Restoring the Soul, and he just said he wanted to come and spend a week doing therapy and soul care. We do something called integrated clinical soul care. And I knew right away that he had some important things to disclose. And at the end of day one, he said to me, we meet with people three hours a day, Monday through Friday, for most of the time, two weeks. He was here for one week. At the end of the first day, he said, I'm telling you this now so that I don't chicken out tomorrow, but I have to make a confession. Will you hear my confession? Well, I'm an ordained minister of the gospel, and I, I was like, yes, that's what we do. I've heard a lot of confessions. And... I have always said, um, I'm never surprised by anything after doing this for 30 years, but I was surprised by his confession. Silver-haired pastor of a church of a couple thousand that grew over years, Ivy League, Master of Divinity, Doctor of Ministry, uh, very successful leader, came back on day two, and I could tell he was nervous and his mouth was dry, and he leaned forward and he said, you know that song by U2? And I was like, I know every song by U2. Which one are you referring to? Uh, he said, uh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. My grandmother prayed for me before I was even born, when I was, when I was in my mama, and she prayed that I would be a preacher, and I am. And I've got all of this success, and here's my confession. And he took a deep breath. And if he had confessed at that point to being part of Al-Qaeda and ready to blow up the Eiffel Tower, I could not have been more surprised by what this man of God said. I don't know God. And there was a long pregnant pause as if he wanted to run out of the room. And he was waiting for how I would respond and I was kind of doing that therapeutic tension, tug of war of I'm not going to speak first. And after a long silence, with tears in his eyes, he said, do you think this is something we can talk about? Do you think this is something we talk about? And I leaned forward and I took a deep breath. And I said, oh yeah. There's, there's nothing more important than talking about this, and I just took some time to honor him for his incredible courage. Because of his resume and because of the paperwork that he had filled out, I already knew that he was a born-again Christian, so this was not an issue of salvation. I knew that um, his theology would have aligned with asking Christ into his life at a young age and that he was saved. But he was saying something more than that. I, I don't have any abundance. There's nothing that is spilling and brimming over. There's no fullness. I've never really experienced God. And so I listened and I listened and it became a really powerful week. But the next day I said... What you shared reminds me of a time when I was a Christian, 1994. I was about 14 years a believer. I had a really dramatic conversion as a junior in high school. And um, 14 years in, I was married three years. I was sexually addicted. 
I had been unfaithful to my wife in a number of ways. I was drinking on my lunch hour while working at a mental health clinic with substance abusers. And just to, just to numb the anxiety and the shame inside of me. And I, I did this routine that I have come to since call lather, rinse, repeat, which whether you have sexual addiction and compulsion or whether you eat too much, it's a cycle that Paul was talking about in Romans 7, that I'm finding myself doing things that I hate and not doing things that I want to do. And so my wife didn't know about the extent of it, and it all came out on July 10th, 1994, the worst day of my life and the best day of my life. And we just celebrated our, our 30th anniversary, which is really a miracle. And uh, I live every day with a sense of gratitude for what I've been given. But about three months before D-Day, before everything blew up, I'm standing in church, and you can tell it was a Baptist church because if it was Presbyterian, I'd be standing with my hands here open. This is raised hands in a Presbyterian church. <laughs> Baptist church, you know, you're like a young life skit where the hands are in the shoes and that kind of thing. But the songs are going, there's worship songs, and this happened over and over again where I'm, I'm looking at the lyrics and I'm going, I believe that. It's true, but it's not real. I believe that it's true, but it's not real. There was a time where I, I sing that song, Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. Lord, you are more costly than gold. I know you all want me on the worship team now. <laughs> Lord, you are more precious than silver, and nothing I desire compares with you. And my immediate thought was, <laughs> yeah, right. And one perspective might be, you know, that's demonic. That's, a, that's an accusation like in Revelation 12. And I would say, yes, and. Some people would say, well, that's just a cognitive distortion. You need to get cognitive therapy and to address that. Or, you know, you don't have enough of the word of God inside of you. But I have been memorizing scripture for, for at least a decade and a lot of it. I used to go to the Bill Gothard seminar as a, as a young porn addict, and, and basically, if you memorize Romans 6 and Romans 8 and James chapter 1 and all these other things, which I did, then your problem will go away. And my problem got worse. <laughs> because the harder I worked to overcome this lack of abundance, this, this lack of vitality, this lack of satisfaction to the deep thirst in my heart, the harder I would work and not be successful, the more ashamed I became, and the more I came to believe that God wouldn't want anything to do with me if I basically did nothing for him. And so my life had to blow up. So here I am three months before that day, and I believe it was the first honest prayer that I ever prayed. And I said, God, I believe in you, and I believe this is all true. But if this is all there is to Christianity, I'm not sure I can say this. I'm not sure I should say this. I feel kind of scared telling you this. But if, if this is all there is, then I don't know if I want to be a Christian. And guess what I heard? Thank you! Because the truth will set you free. And this is truth, right? It's living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. But that's not the whole of truth. That truth has to bump up against our truth. And sometimes we can have all of the truth of Scripture and not tell ourselves the truth. There's a number of uh, writers, one of whom is Gerald May, that wrote a book called Addiction and Grace, and in that book, he says that the chief characteristic of all addiction and compulsion is self-deception. That we lie to ourselves long before we ever lie to anyone else. And there's a lot of um, very dishonest people who have never told a lie. God, I don't, I don't know if I want to be a Christian if this is all there is. See, I've become so desperate that going to heaven 
really didn't mean much to me anymore. And to be honest with you, that's never really been my motivation. I'm, I've never been, a, you know, I want to accept Jesus so I can go to heaven. I, I accepted Jesus because I was a sexually abused, broken, dysfunctional, depressed, bipolar, Asperger's on the autism spectrum guy who life just never really made sense. But I, I discovered Jesus when I was 16 and I discovered that I'm highly relational and that I have a sense of humor and I can make people laugh. And, and something in me said, I just found some buried treasure. I didn't even know that I was carrying it, but it was in this old pair of jeans and I reached into my pocket and here's all these, these gifts that I've been given and it's like currency. And now I'm going to spend this currency and I'm going I'm to get my needs met. I'm going to get people's attention and affection. And of course, none of that is stated because I'm doing ministry with the youth of America. But my heart was very, very hungry for living water and it never came. Is Scott McKnight here yet? He wrote an article uh, on a blog post that I read just two days ago. He's examining theologically this whole idea of deconstruction, which is now a word that you hear everywhere. And the funny thing is, is it's kind of this uh, Generation Z, uh, millennial, under 45-year-old word, but it's really a word that's been around since the early church. There's just different words for it. And it's this idea of coming undone and letting go of the things that are unhealthy and that don't work. And so deconstruction can be very important, but my sadness and my concern is there's no reconstruction going on. We can all talk about the, the people that are walking out of church, the nuns, N-O-N-E, not N-U-N, and we're talking about the people that no longer believe, and you hear people like Bart Campolo, Tony's son, who was doing ministry with Tony, and now he's an atheist chaplain at the University of Southern California. And you hear people like Josh Harris, who wrote, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, and Josh Kissed God Goodbye. Or at least he calls himself an I don't know. I'm just not that guy anymore. How do people get there? And how did I get to the place where I said, if this is what being a Christian is, I don't, I don't want to be one, when I had some of the finest discipleship to this day still in the country, where I went through Design for Discipleship, Navigator Notebooks, and Topical Memory System, Scripture Memories, and Saturday morning, 6 a.m., He-Man, Super Spiritual Bible Studies, that if you get up that early, then you're really you know, committed to Christ. I had a clipboard at one point with with five different categories of the word, memorize, study, meditate, and then just, it was, it was crazy. And I actually thought that if I checked those boxes, that God would be pleased with me and that that's how I would get this abundant life. And so when I sat with Pastor Dan and he said, I don't know God, I knew and I know exactly what he meant. Because back then, had Jesus walked into the room, I don't know if I had recognized him. Because I, I think I, I would have been looking for some British school marm or schoolmaster looking at me like this with harshness, with a sense of disappointment, with a sense of frustration, with a sense of, Michael, I thought you were going to be a good return on the investment of my son's blood. I had entered through the gate, the gate that is Jesus, but I discovered that there was no sheep pen. It was all living water, but no pipes. And not to be cute, but Jesus donated his blood and transfused me, but my heart was broken, and the blood that was life-giving just leaked out. Our hearts are simply containers that hold love. And until they're whole, it's virtually impossible to have any kind of sustained life with God. 
And could that be why Jesus, in his first public sermon after coming out of the desert, Luke 4 tells us, he goes into a temple, opens the scroll, and he reads from Isaiah 61, that classic passage of the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Here's my mission. He's anointed me to what? Preach good news to the poor. It's not in Luke, but the implication is he would have read all of Isaiah 61. To bind up broken hearts, to set captives free, to exchange beauty for ashes, mourning for gladness, lament for praise. In other words, that Jesus came to enter into all that's broken, all that's fragmented, all that's distorted, all that is ruptured, and to put it back together and to make it whole, beginning with whole hearts. And so I I love Jim's work, and I love this conference, and I love what's happening here, because spiritual formation, and there's, of course, so many different definitions, it is primarily about making us whole. And in my work as a therapist and pastor, I call this the gap, simply the gap. For me, here's the answer to the question of how did I get there? How did these other folks get there? Why why are people just giving up on their faith, like my 24-year-old son? Christian school, Christian preschool, uh, all kinds of Christian activities, praying at dinner, and just, just really not interested. And here's the thing. I personally have not met one person who has said, I'm leaving or I'm not a Christian because I don't believe it's true. I've not met one person. I know they're out there. Somebody who has sat down and analyzed the life of faith and said, nope, just doesn't make sense. Instead, it's people that are disillusioned because the promise of abundant life and streams of living water and bread that you can eat and you will never be hungry or thirsty again and what is actually delivered, there's this massive gap. There is a gap today in the church, in most churches, between what we believe and what we experience. And this gap is what spiritual formation can best tend to. Let me keep up with my slides. The work work of spiritual formation is to tend to the gap between what believe, should be what we believe, what believe and what we experience. There's people that come to spiritual direction, spiritual formation therapy, and they go, I don't know what I believe. And that means that they're in a process of being disoriented. And here's one of the big takeaways for today that's not on a slide. I I, I say this over and over again. Whatever is unfavorable in our life, God, I don't know what I believe. Uh, I struggle to believe that you exist. I struggle to believe that you're good. I struggle to believe that you answer prayer. I struggle to know what to do when when I find myself doing things I don't want to do. Whatever is unfavorable, struggle, negative, that we want to get rid of, instead of that being a barrier, it's the bridge. It's the bridge. God, I'm 16 years old, and I just came to faith, and and I believe that you died for my sins, but I I can't stop stealing pornography from the 7-Eleven or digging in dumpsters or going to my dad's footlocker and literally taking a hammer and breaking the padlock because I've got to get in there like an addict who needs a fix. God, I can't can't stop doing that. We'll go talk to your youth pastor and get some more scripture. But see, the scripture, when there's a deeper issue, when there's a deeper rupture, becomes just another gate that says, here's what to do, here's how to lock it up, here's how to make sure the gate is secure, and there's no fence. There's nothing to contain a human person. There's nothing that can give you a pathway to becoming whole. See, a gate or a law cannot create life unless the gate is life itself, who is Jesus, and opens this path into this spacious place for us to be as messy as we need to be, as broken as we actually are, as confused as we might become at any given time. And the message of the cross and the God that's revealed there is that is not a barrier when you bring it into the light, when you trust me with it. It's the bridge. It's the bridge. So things like sexual struggles, which are 
rampant in culture today, and this is not a purity talk, like coming to a college campus and I'm the guy that gives the purity talk. It's, it's really a talk about um, wholeness and freedom. So, I had entered through the gate and there was no sheep pen. I want to do an experiment with you before I talk about what's going on in the absence of wholeness and how we as followers of Jesus can be formed in Christ in a way that we close the gap between belief and experience. And it has to do with this topic of what psychologists and neurobiologists and psychiatrists call attachment. How many of you have heard a talk, a TED talk, a psychologist, your therapist, your pastor talk about attachment? Okay, it's just the word for how to be securely connected to the other, and in the case of infants and children, how to be able, how, how a person develops while getting their needs met, their God-given legitimate needs by another. But first I want to do an experiment. I'm going to ask you in a minute, if you're comfortable, to close your eyes. We're not going to levitate or anything like that, okay? Jim would be upset with that if I pulled a Teresa of Avila and we just all started floating. <laughs> in a minute, if you're comfortable, I'll ask you to close your eyes and I'm going to say a word. And I'm going to say it about seven times. And then I'll ask you to open your eyes and like popcorn, I want you all just to say what you felt and experienced, okay? Then, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes again, and I'm gonna say another word, and we'll do the same thing. This should take about 90 seconds. Sound, sound fun? Okay, you didn't know you were gonna do like a woo-woo experiment today. By the way, Dr. James Bryan Smith, having grown up Catholic, I was sitting in the back, and I never thought I would have come to a Quaker university where they honored the Blessed Virgin Mary, like they did in the second song. Okay, take a deep breath. If you're comfortable, close your eyes and just listen as I say this word seven times. No. 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 No, 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 no. You may open your eyes. What did you feel, think, or experience? Just one word, just go ahead and speak it out. Okay. I heard words like oppression, shame, anger, fear, irritated, annoyed, unworthy. Take a deep breath. Go ahead and close your eyes again. Yes. 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 Go ahead and open your eyes. Now, go ahead and speak out what it is that you heard. Okay. Validation, acceptance, safety, loved. What in the world's going on there? Is it a magic trick? No, it's called embodiment. You know, the emphasis on the soul here is so important because that's the inner life. The Greek idea of soul is actually the mind, the emotions, and the will. The Hebrew idea of soul, which is far more holistic, includes, and this is consistent with what Dallas Willard would say in Renovation of the Heart, the body, the mind, the emotions, and the will. And since, I don't know, the 6th, 7th century, and certainly since the Reformation, and certainly in America with digital technology, we have, we have dissociated embodiment and the physicality of who we are from spirituality. And until we reconnect embodiment to spirituality, I believe that the church will falter 
And as Gordon McDonald said years ago, when he came back from his fall, he went off the map for three years. And he came back and he preached to the Christian Association of Psychological Studies. And one of the things he said is that in the church, most of the time, we preach to people as if they're at their best. Well, Jesus never preached to anybody at their best. He preached to people into their reality, whatever that was. And he never shied away from it. Second thing McDonald said is that the gospel as it's preached today is inadequate to heal broken people. Would we all agree that our culture and our world is pretty broken? Now, don't answer this out loud, would you agree that you are pretty broken? Now, maybe not traumatized, sexually abused, but chronic illness, pandemic, financial problems, divorce, struggles with faith, parenting, a sense of who am I if my kid is messed up and what will people think about me? We live in a broken world and our hearts and our lives are broken. And so how we begin to heal is to bring our real selves before God, including that part of us that when we hear in a thousand different ways, no, the tension the unworthiness, the nausea, the lack of safety, the headache, the wanting to flee, that we bring that to God and say, I don't, I, I'm not a guru, I, I'm not a meditator, I, I don't know what to do, maybe I should watch Dr. Phil, but I know that my body is so tight if I try to do centering prayer or meditation or go to a retreat center or, or just kind of light a candle and be quiet with Jesus. It's like my body just can't let go and I'm thinking a thousand thoughts like, like there's this cocktail party in my head and, 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 and God, I don't, I don't know what to do so I guess I'll just try to read my Bible every day this week and hopefully, hopefully that'll work. Now we're all sophisticated believers so we'd go, well no, we wouldn't really do that. But most of us, and I'm preaching to myself, really have a, a, a transactional spirituality. I know you saved me by grace, Jesus, but if I do this, then you're going to do this. And I believe God answers prayer, and he has delivered me from addiction, and he has answered prayers. But sometimes God's mercy means that he's just not very cooperative with our agendas. Thanks be to God. So there's four, there's two more slides I want to share with you. This is not elegant transitions like certain, but, but I'm saying what I want to say. The nature of spiritual formation is developmental. Our spiritual lives are as developmental and sequential as our physical, emotional, and intellectual development. I was talking to Bill uh, yesterday, uh, from Soul Shepherding, and we talked about this book, uh, The Critical Journey, and it's one of the classic texts that talks about the stages of spiritual development. And we, we, we know that infant is born and then starts to toddle and preschool and grade school and junior high and high school, you know, and if someone is still not talking when they're 18 years old, that's probably a problem. But we don't think the same way about spiritual development, and we should. We will only experience the love and goodness of God to the degree that we have learned to trust, learned to be loved, and learned to receive. If you were to ask me, tell me about your spiritual journey the last 20 years, uh, I wouldn't tell you about Bible study and great insights that I've gotten. I wouldn't tell you about a lot of Christian books that I've read, except for James Bryan Smith. I've read all of his twice. And, and we should. What I, what I would tell you is that my journey has been one through great pain and exposure of shame and failure to keep my promises. I've had to learn to trust, to trust that God really is who he says he is. I've had to learn how to be loved and how to receive. All right, write this down. Years ago, I read a book called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. How many of you remember that book? I read it. I got to the end. I was like, I don't get it. I don't, still don't know the spiritual secret. 
okay? So you can fill me in afterwards. Here's Michael's spiritual secret. If you want to have a powerful Christian life, if you want to be fruitful for the kingdom, if you want your life on planet Earth to change the world, be loved. Not love God, be loved. I wish that there were a semester-long course somewhere in a spiritual formation uh, program on being loved and unpacking the verse in 1 John. We love because... He first loved us. That should be discipleship 098. Not 99, not 100, not 101. 098. Before you do anything, spend a year just being loved by God. Bring your worst to us. Become, get a master's in messy. And we go, yeah, that, that's nice. But we, we are people that we choose doing over being. And I think the majority of us in this room, because I hear this over and over again, like me would say, I just, I, I'm really good at giving and serving and showing up for Bible study, but I just, it's really hard for me to receive. Anybody identify with that? I, I want to say to myself when I say that, well, I thought you said you were a Christian. That's a hard word. You can't really be a Christian. Now, I don't mean that literally. I'm not saying you're not safe. You can't be a Christian if you can't receive. Because it's all about receptivity. Living water that is a stream has to go somewhere. Bread has to be digested. Do you know that in the liturgical tradition, Episcopal, England, uh, Anglican, Catholic, Lutheran, that when you come forward for the Lord's Supper, Communion, Eucharist, you don't reach and take the bread and put it in your mouth. When I was a little boy growing up, you'd fold your hands, open your mouth, and the priest would put the Eucharist on your tongue. And today, in the Anglican Church, you hold out your hand, and the priest puts the bread in your hand. And the reason for that is the first sin that led to the fall of man, this relational rupture, was reaching and grasping. And all liturgy is symbolic as if to say, you can't grasp God. You can only be grasped by God. You can only receive. So to the degree that we experience this love and goodness, that's the degree to which we will close this gap. And tending to the gap, is almost always how we learn to metabolize love. What is metabolism? Metabolism is when you ingest something, you take something in, and it's converted and used for energy. We metabolize love by receiving love and mercy and grace and forgiveness and presence and embrace and generosity and kindness and all of the things that we receive from the Father that looks like Jesus. And then as we receive those things, they're taken in, they're digested, they are imparted, they're distributed throughout our spiritual, physical, emotional being, and they become energy and life that is then like living water that goes back out to water hungry hearts and the earth to, as the Jews say, to kun olam, to repair the world. And in our ministry, in this work that we do of spiritual formation, it's really about repairing hearts, repairing souls. And that's how the kingdom comes and God's will is being done. So how do we learn to metabolize love? It comes back to this idea of attachment. And I have four blocks here that I want to use. And this idea is not original with me. I asked Kurt Thompson, the psychiatrist and interpersonal neurobiologist, um, did Dan Siegel come up with this? He said, I don't know. So he called Dan Siegel the Buddhist psychiatrist, interpersonal neurobiologist, and Dan said, I just heard it somewhere. So nobody knows where it has come from. It's like most C.S. Lewis quotes. C.S. Lewis never said it, but you just attribute it you know, to him. <laughs> C.S. Lewis once said, semper ubi sub ubi, <laughs> which in Catholic school, that's the first Latin phrase you learn. It means always wear underwear. <laughs> but C.S. Lewis said it. A 
attachment theory. Uh, they used to talk about attachment theory zero to four years old, that if you got what you needed by four years old, then you're good. And now they speak of attachment womb to tomb. What that means is when I'm 85 in the nursing home or wherever I am, if the Lord gives me that many years, that I have the same attachment needs at some level as the infant and that we all have these needs. The attachment creates a basis and a foundation of relational trust and security. It's the basis of how our bodies regulate or dysregulate in relationship to others. Attachment is the basis upon which you react when I say that word, no. It might be that you didn't sleep last night because we don't want to blame everything on this. It might be because you ate too much. But our ability to absorb that and to feel safe and present is based on that. And finally, this attachment is the basis of our ability to metabolize love. I want to run through these and then I'll close. I don't expect you to see this if you're not up front, but the first block is of four S's Every human being, beginning in infancy, needs these four things. And the first is to be seen, S-E-E-N, seen. So I hear people say all the time, you know, all I'm praying for is that my child is healthy when they come out and I'm going to count all ten fingers and all toes and I've never met anybody who's done that when the child is born or who told me they do that because all you do, all I did with my son, our daughter was adopted and I did the same thing when they put her in my arms, is you go, wow, here's this pure, innocent human being, and you see them. And with my son, I did not know him because he just appeared, and yet I knew him. I knew something about his essence. I knew nothing about what he would become, but I knew him, and I had a relationship with him as if it had, it had existed. That same infant is born with, uh, some of these psychiatrists tell me, between 40 and 50% of their active neurons in their brain. The adult human brain has 80 billion neurons, so 40 to 50% of those, they're there, but they're not turned on like a computer. And do you know how they get turned on? How those neurons, bing, 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 come on, by eye contact. So when the parent holds the child, or the grandma, or the aunt, or the caregiver, and that child can, can look in the parent's eyes, there's what's called an interpersonal neuroceptive it's kind of like a, a, an arc between two human beings where there's something that actually exists in that space where eye contact starts to turn on neurons in that brain in the same way as if you flipped a switch on a light, which is absolutely remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. And that is how dependent that infant is upon that gaze of being seen. And then... Junior starts to walk and run and swing a wiffle ball bat or dance or color and good parents go, wow. And my son brings home a piece of paper with complete scribbles on it. And I go, wow, that's great. What is that called? And he said, it's called seven dog leashes. Just scribbles. He made the name up on the spot, but it was brilliant. <laughs> seven dog leashes. I think that's what Picasso did. As our children grow... They need to know that we get them, that we see them beneath their performance, beneath their credibility, beneath their relevance, their attractiveness, that we see who they are, just like God does with us. The second thing is that that infant and that Michael, who is 57 years old, that infant needs to be soothed. When they're in pain, when they're hungry, when they're cold, because infants can't regulate their own body temperature. The parent and Mary took Jesus in, even though it was the Middle East, wrapped him in a swaddling clothes. And parents do that. They bundle the kid up. Why? Because that, that cares for them and soothes them. And when that child is crying, the parent comes and says, shh, it's okay. They might sing a lullaby. They might shake them, but it soothes them. Their distress is taken away or minimized. And that child that is soothed grows up with a neurological ability to soothe themselves in healthy ways as opposed to unhealthy ways. 
and I didn't get seen or soothing in my alcoholic home, and I spent a large portion of my childhood hiding under my bed where I hid Nestle's chocolate chips and other sweets that I could store underneath there to be able to soothe myself. And I became a poster child for a future addict by doing that. And because of the Protestant work ethic and our try-hard mentality where you just suck it up and move on, many Christians go, I'm good. I don't need soothing. I don't need comfort. And so we just, well, I won't say we, I, stay up much later than I should and watch too many episodes of Netflix. We need to be soothed because God is a God who soothes and we're made in his image. Safety. Seen, soothed, safe. A safety from physical harm, a safety from emotional harm. Protecting the child from those earliest days of dependency all the way up to our kid in college who isn't going to class and they're depressed and we we call and arrange counseling for them and to get on medication, whatever that might be, that there's somebody advocating. If seen, soothed, and safe are relatively in place, then a child will develop what's called a secure attachment base, a secure attachment. In other words, that they are able to bond to the other person because they feel safe, they feel like it's okay to be them, that they can show up in their world and in their family and not have to dial down who they are, they don't have to disown themselves. And this security is something that takes root neurologically, emotionally, physically, and spiritually as well. It's much more than just parents model what God is like, but parents, and I'm a parent, so this is not about shaming anybody, we actually, we actually shape the wiring and the neurological resilience that sets us up by to trust, to receive, to be loved, which then really pre-wires us to have a spirituality that is set up for grace. And this is why in my story and for so many of us that we have a hard time receiving grace and getting to that place where belief becomes experience until we encounter some kind of obstacle or some kind of, some kind of barrier where we go, this just isn't working. And I don't know if I want to keep doing this. The security that comes from these four S's is brilliantly, brilliantly written in the book of Matthew. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. The last verse of Matthew chapter 3, and then the story of the temptation in the desert. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So Jesus is about to go to the desert for 40 days. The Father and the Holy Spirit have said, for whatever reason, we're okay with this. My boy is going to go and have a date with the devil. And he's not going to eat. And so here's what he needs. He goes to John the Baptist, his cousin, and John fights him. And interestingly, Jesus says, we need to baptize me. And it says in the text, and John consented. God always waits for our consent. John consented. Okay, I'll baptize you. And consent is the first thing. Consent becomes the gate that we walk through into this process of closing the gap between belief and experience, between between being formed here and where we want to be. Uh, it's, it's the gateway to healing. Yes, God, yes. So, the Trinity is there. It's amazing, and I've never seen this until recently. This baptism of Jesus, it's not just that the Father speaks, the Spirit of God descends and shines a light on him. Picture Las Vegas, one of those giant spotlights. The Spirit descended and alighted on Jesus. God the Father saying, let me show off my son And the reason why I have such passion for this is because this is what I'm like. And the world doesn't yet know that. They think that they have to follow laws. And so that's this moment where Jesus hears from his father, you are loved 
and I am well pleased with you. Turn the page, chapter 4, he goes out into the desert. And the first thing is an attack in opposition where the devil says, I don't see you. Do you know why? It's the fourth temptation of Jesus. There's only three temptations listed, but it's this. If you are the Son of God. He is the Son of God. There are angels around, and the devil has the audacity to say, if you are the Son of God, I don't see you, creator of the universe. You're invisible to me, so prove it, if that's really who you are. You think you're so tough? The devil is saying you're not seen, and he's chipping away at that attachment need. Soothed. You're hungry? Matthew makes the brilliant point. He didn't eat for 40 days, and he was hungry. You're hungry, stomach's growling, low blood sugar, headaches, parched lip. I can turn these stones to bread. I'll soothe you. I'll fill your stomach. I'll give you satisfaction. I'll take away your pain and your distress. Safety. You know, I want you to go up to that highest point in Jerusalem, which is interesting because it's like the devil is saying, let me take you to the place, the center point of this, this life of God and, and let me see if I can shame you, but climb way up to the top of that temple and jump. Because after all, your father said that his angels will be commanded to, to take care of you. If you jump, they'll save you. The devil is saying, I'll be your safety, trust me. And then the final temptation is uh, the devil saying to Jesus, worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, which apparently he could do, if you will bow down and give yourself to me. In other words, Jesus, hungry, incarnate, weak, vulnerable, God become man in flesh who has to sleep and eat and go to the bathroom, you don't have to turn to your father to be seen, soothed, safe, and secure. And here's the original lie in Genesis. You can make yourself secure. And the gospel says you can't make yourself secure and you don't have to because love has you. Love has you. If I were to come up with three words to represent what the Christian gospel is. Love has you. God is love. Love has you. How do we change? How do we close the gap? How do we make this seen, soothe, safe, secure a reality in our life without 25 years of therapy? Be loved and be still. Before my son moved to Washington, he has many tattoos and body piercings and hair down to his waist, and I love him like crazy. He said, Dad, let's go get a tattoo. You've been saying for a couple of years uh, you're going to get one. I'm like, I don't know what I would say. He said, you've got to do it. I leave tomorrow. So we went out, and I got on my left arm, and I'm right-handed. So this represents my limitation, my vulnerability, my weakness. I had be loved. Be loved. I'm right handed, so this is my strength, and it says be still. Be loved, be still. How do we develop attachment so that we can feel secure in our relationship with God, in this space between what we believe and what we experience? We position ourselves to be loved in all kinds of ways, and generally that means taking risks and being vulnerable with others to know who you actually are, and to be still, to cease striving, to risk just being, to not have to perform, to just be you. Because God created you to grow up and to become yourself so that by being you, you would be fruitful and multiply, not in terms of having babies, but in terms of bringing forth after metabolizing the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that your life would feed a hungry world and a world that is dying for living water. So let's believe the gospel of I am the gate and the one that comes to me 
can have abundance and life to the full. But it happens as we learn to trust, to be loved, and to receive. So I pray a blessing over you and your lives and your stories, and may the God of peace continue to make you whole. In Jesus' name, amen.